Revolutionary War. The grandest in Hebrew was higher than that of Glastonbury. And I, I think that, you know, you look at that and think, Jeepers, how's that possible? But it, I really think it was the mill sites. And thanks to Marianne Foote and Jeff Kirkham and the rest of the team that investigated and confirmed the mill sites, we actually can uncover them enough to show you where they are. And they're from one end of the town to the other. So this is not the first time we're doing a mill site hike. It's, there's going to be more of them. And if you have questions or concerns, you can talk to Marianne or Jeff, and, and they'll, they'll give you the information as much as we know it. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn this over to Marianne Foote, who's our historian, the town historian. And she's got a few words, and some from Reverend Mill, <laughs> Reverend Mill who wrote um, a sermon. And an awful lot of it was about the, um, the town, the area of Hope Valley. So I'm going to turn it over to Marianne. At, uh, in about 1805, the first Methodist church was built on Burroughs Hill. I'm not saying on the road, but somewhere on Burroughs Hill, 1805. And then by 1828, it must have been flourishing because the Methodists moved to Hebron Center, center of town, where they paid, listen to this deal, they paid $100 to the town, and the town paid $260 to put a second floor on Center School. Center School is the location of the American Legion, not the same building. But that's where it was. So it was a school building, and they paid that money so that they could use the second floor on weekends for the services while the town used it the rest of the time for their meetings, their offices, their whatevers. Until one day, and of course I love this story, they were meeting upstairs and the supports let go, oh. the joists or whatevers they are let go, and all the people, the men of course, the women wouldn't have been involved in that meeting, anyway let go and all the people slid down to first floor. Oh wow. So at that point, the Methodists by then had, had gotten rid of that idea and they had built a new building in the center of town in 1838. And you can recognize it as Old Town Hall. So that was built in 1838 and that became actually the Methodist third area of meeting. And then by 1849, Someone here gave the gave the land for this, and this is only a tenth of an acre, but that's all that remains. But then they built this in about 49, and that was taken over that way. But the thing that I love is that this was built to be a, not necessarily a Methodist society, but an area for the share and for the spiritual, whatever religion. And the, um, the um, Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, used it at times with them. The only problem was that the Adventists were having their services on Saturdays, and the Methodists were still down in the summer working all the land. I mean, you can imagine all the noise, all the enjoyment of the people that were down there. And if you go outside and look around, you can see where it might once have been open. So they were out there, and then on Sundays you had the reverse when the Methodists were trying to have their service and the Seventh-day Adventists were down there making as much noise as they could, and not for that reason. <coughs> but they also had a wonderful area, June can probably kick in and tell us about that, with the camp meetings held at Barber's Pond. Now point to Barber's Pond area. Back there. How mm -hmm. far? Oh, quarter mile. Quarter mile, that close. And supposedly, that was the location of the first camp meetings in Connecticut. I, I just read that one recently, but I believe it. And this tells this, this get up to about 15, 1500 it says. Yeah. And, and what they did during these camp meetings, a lot of people just came and put up tents, but a lot also came in just for the day, back and forth. And it doesn't mention any alcohol at all. It mentions a very active 
loud, wonderful time full of prayers, exhortations, reading the Bible, singing of animated hymns, carrying on, but all in a good way. So that was, that's the area you're in right now. Um, because all the people that were named on the deed for this church, long gone, can't be located, nor their, nor their um, relatives or anything. So this, this building is cared for by, I don't know what you call it, the Reedy Hill Hope Valley community. I don't know, it's, it's all the wonderful people that live right around here that assume responsibility for this building. And so that's what this is, and you don't use it very much. You use it sometimes if people want to have wedding ceremonies, yeah. and you have your Christmas. Which was the same, same through to the same name as, as the Adventists, but I don't know if people would know it by that name, yes. Then they woke up the next day and it was still around.
he also put in a tremendous amount of work and he put a book together called A Little Bit of Heaven. And it really goes back to Benjamin Skinner, who was one of the first people here that moved in this area. And we'll go over that when we get closer to the mill. So hopefully I can take and pull things together, you know, along with the history and then along with some of the other information there. So, uh, you know what? Let's take and get our minds in a mindset here. Let's go back to the early 1800s and the early 1700s and try to look out here and look at the fields as Mary Ann mentioned here. Not the trees here, but look at the fields going across, down, and then up the hill on the other side. And let's go for a walk and uh, we'll try to give you some more. This is the Jeremy River, okay? And it's part of the Salmon River watershed. So if you go up to Burn Hill Park and Holbrook's Pond, this is where it starts, up there. And then it comes down all the way down to Holbrook's Pond across the road there, down uh, across the, to Porter's Mill, which is off of 66. Comes down behind there, behind the Hebron Elementary School. Comes up here, if you come down Hope Valley, you see where it crossed there. And then it goes into what we call Barber's Pond up here. And we'll talk about more like that when we come up here on the way out and we talk about the other mill here. So then it comes down through here. And this is the Jeremy River here. Now, the Jeremy River goes down and around, and I'll be able to point it out to you when we look at the other mill site down there. But uh, Hope Valley stream or river runs into that. It runs down through, down by Grayville, through that area there. It meets up probably a mile and a half down from down there to where Judd Brook crosses off of Route 85. Then it goes down and works its way across to, almost into, through Westchester. Do you know where the old um, uh, paper factory was down there? Brick, they, they tore that down. So then it works its way down through that way there and it meets up with Black Ledge and flows right into the Salmon River. So then if you go into the Salmon River and you follow that all the way down through and you're in the Connecticut River. So let's go back to somewhere around, somewhere between 1709 and say 1715 when they built. This is the original dam here that you see here. And this probably went down another 10 feet. And there's a lot of fill here from when they did the road and they built the bridge. So if you look across here, now you'll see there's a foundation over here on the left-hand side. Uh, Dick Simons, who's the gentleman that worked with on uh, the mill site, this guy is just, you know, he's just got more information than I could hold. But we feel this was an emergency spillway over here. Okay, so when the water got up so high, or, and this is very, very reactive to rain, uh, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how high this can get. So that's the emergency spill site went there. And then if you go over where they, I got the wood piled on there, that was where the raceway starts. So as we go back up and we start to walk, I'll show you how the raceway made its way all the way down to the, the grist mill site. So, um, but the water has gotten so high here, if you look from underneath, the top of the underneath there, from our living room, I looked and it was that far from the top one time and the water just curled and these stones that you see here go all the way through you couldn't even see them they were all covered with water so inside the house you can just feel the energy <laughs> so they had to control this okay right. so that's why they had the you know the dam here and they had what they call penstocks penstock is what is the mechanism that they use to control, open the water up and release the water. Okay, and we'll talk about that more when we work our way through. But um, so there's with the mills, it, as this gets almost dry, I mean, there's always water up here, but not so down there. So what they had, if you didn't have a con uh, continual flow of water, they had to store it. So they would block the dam, close the penstocks, and they may have it where it may take three or four days to fill it, so they may only do gristing, the grist melt, they only may do it twice a week. So when the water gets up to a certain level, then they can release it, and then the miller goes ahead and, uh, you know, starts to do the grinding. So, 
All right, so we'll walk up here, and then we'll walk down, and I'll point out the, uh, the raceway. So there's an upper race and a lower race. We're going to be looking at the upper race here, because that's the one that feeds the mill. Any, uh, any questions? Well, yeah. Here before the, the bridge. I think before there was. I think there was another bridge. That's before your time. I, well, a couple of years. A couple of years before my time. But I'm pretty sure they they got across it because of the way they had to. Uh, this mill site here and the other mills, so they had been, they continuously worked. That would have been quite a, you know, quite a bit back there. It would have been a lot wider than yeah, there. I, I, the, oh, yeah. The bridge probably wasn't at this location. It was probably another location. You can see it's really a real defined raceway here. And so if you're out looking around and hitting some of the other mills in town or in different places, you know, this is the type of thing you want to look for. I mean, when I started going out with Dick, you know how you go out, you, you know, you go out and you look at the, the woods, but you never see the trees. Mm. Well, he, he got me so I can start seeing the trees. So now if I get out there, I'm getting fairly good at it. So, but you know, you look for the, for the raceway and then you look for maybe remnants of a foundation. And uh, we, we went to one, uh, actually, we think we found another one at the Hubert, Herbert property. It's a new one that the town just took over. There's a mill. There's a mill in there also, and it doesn't show up on all the maps. But as you go through, a lot of it was the owner. They backfilled in there, so we had to find where the mill site was. And well, part of it was we found the raceway, and we were able to use that as a means to uh, finding the rest of it. And so it's still got to be uh, more work there to figure out what we got. But, all right. So if you see how this. And we'll get, walk down and around. This is where the sawmill was. So you can see where there's a lane that goes down that way. And then it continues down this way also. Well, there's when I mentioned penstock before. There was a penstock here. And that way, that way they're, that, that is a, a mechanism where they could close it off from the water going through. In the earlier days, they, they were made out of wood, and they would just drop wooden slats down in. But they also, uh, and I've got some pictures on the table down here, that they had metal ones where they could move a wheel, and it would take and lift it up to let the water go through. But you got to figure, there was a lot of force going through here. Because, and as we get down to the grist mill, and I explain a little bit to you on that, they, uh, the miller had to know what the volume of the water is, had to know the... Uh, how high the pitch was. I mean, there was a lot of things, and I'll go over a little bit more of that on the way down. And we'll go around there and see the sawmill, but what you've got to look at here is probably the road was down lower here, and the sawmill sat on top of those columns. So if you could take, and then they had beams that came out like this. They would drop off the logs. They'd roll them, you know, take them into the sawmill uh, from here. So if you can kind of see how high it was, you visualize that, but like a lot of the old buildings, the mills, sawmills, grist mills, and whatever, they all burned down, or most of them did. And we'll go over why some of the grist mills would burn. There's so much up front work adding money to build a mill, and uh, all the rents and everything, where did that money come from? They were, well, the people that were given, well, Benjamin Skinner, and I'll go into him a little bit, he was the, uh, he actually came from Colchester, probably in, in the early 1700s, around Oh, between 1700 and like 1709, I'm going to say 1709, somewhere in that area, but at a, it's, it's stated that at a town meeting in 1709, Benjamin Skinner was granted the privilege of a grist mill here in town. Okay, so at that point, it's the, up to the person that's putting up the grist mill to forward, they don't put all the money in that. But the, the millers, were usually pretty well off. Okay, I mean they they had they had funds, and um, he was you know given land, and a lot of the times the the town would put conditions in there that they had to provide you know services to the you know to the, the farmers and the people in town to help support uh, you know the prosperity within the town. So, but as we get down here, there I'll talk more about Benjamin Skinner and also about uh, millwrights and millers. The, Is that right? the Indians, and, and then it was, then it became the property. 
they didn't own it. They were granted privileges, and there was uh, members in the town, the elders, or and, and they were the ones that decided who got land and how it was how divided much? up. Okay. And then, if, you know, eventually it started to break out where, you know, different parcels and, you know, if you were more uh, for process, you know, well to, to do, um, you know, you probably you probably had the opportunity to get more more land or land. But if you look at this here, and you can look around here. Now, once again, try to visualize a building here, okay? On top of the foundation, the raceway came down, spilled in here. This was probably a 20-foot water wheel. So when you look at this, you had two, uh, with this type one, anyway, you got three types of, actually four types of uh, water power. You can have an overshot, which this could have been an overshot where the water comes in and goes over the wheel. You know, looking at this and the height of it, they, they had stone raceway coming down to here, and then they probably had wood that came up here and put it on to the top of the wheel. Or they had what they called the breast shot, and the breast shot hit the wheel in the middle. And then in some areas where, if you look down to that little field down there in front of this side of the, the red truck, mm -hmm. you see a foundation there? Yep. Okay, that was that was a cotton factory, but that was later on. That was in the 1800s. So there was probably a wooden raceway that went from all the way here all the way down there. Uh, went to a mill in that Cabot's Cove here in uh, the Rock, in the Smokies, and they actually had a raceway that was that long. So that put it into my mind that you know what they probably had a wooden raceway here. So, but this. If you look at this mill here, so this Benjamin Skinner, as I mentioned, it's stated that through a uh, town meeting in 1709, he was granted the privilege of putting a grist mill here. So somewhere between then and maybe 1711, this got operational, okay? So millwrights are the ones that built the mill. And I got a book over here that, that was written by uh, Oliver Evans and it was in 1770-something, I think it was, it shows, but it's been reprinted. And uh, actually, I got an autographed copy. So. <laughs> but that, but uh, it, it, you would not believe that the technicality of what the, the millwrights had to do to set it up, the, the, you know, the height of the water, the flow of the water, um, it, 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 and the, the mathematical part of it is, is mind-boggling. You know, you go, how did they do this? And these weren't... Some of these weren't, you know, co they weren't college educated right. people. These were, you know, regular people. Yeah. So. And you have the same year now. Yeah. You know, it's not yeah. winter water flow. Right, right. So that's where, that's where the dam comes into effect. This is where the, you know, the, uh, you got the pet stocks uh, where they control the water. Now, so with the, I'll go a little bit about the, you know, grist milling. So you had the big stones, and we have one up here that I'll show you when we get up there but you had what they called a bed stone. And that was the, the one that was on the bottom and it didn't move. And it had grooves in it going back and forth and they were called uh, harrows and land. And they were all cut in a different fashion. So what would have to happen, the top one, the stone, and a lot of the, the good stones came from Europe and France, okay? So the top one is what they called the, running, or the runner stone. And that's the one that would move around. And uh, the miller, what he would do is when he gets started, he had a couple levers. One would be to control the water flow. And the water flow, once it hit the wheel, the more he opened up, the more water, the faster the stone's going to go. All right? And so then he had another control where he would lower the top stone. And the top stone never touched the bottom stone but it was set up enough so that it would start to grind it. And it was also the stone was tapered, the bottom stone was tapered, uh, going down as it went away from the center or the eye of the stone. And as they did it, and as the stone turned, and they had it all boxed in, by the way, so that through the, uh, the airflow, it, it needed, you needed airflow in there to keep it cool, and you needed to, so that you controlled the moisture. I mean, there was so much to this, it's mind boggling. But by the time it got out to the end of the stone, you had your flour. And then a lot, you know, it had to go through sifters and that type of thing. But uh, 
Have yeah. They ever put it through again? Well, they may have to, but most of it's once. And it, okay. because of the, the different height of the, mm -hmm. of the cuts in the stone, uh -huh. and as it got more towards the end and it got finer, that's when it would take and uh, grind it to a finer stone. Yeah, well, the sifter cleaned a lot of it out after. But the, a lot of the concerns were the uh, grist mills were very flammable. So they called it the dust. So when the dust from, or the flour, they used to be able to clean up around, around the millstones and they would use that flour that they picked up. But uh, some of that, it was, uh, I think it was from oats and there was a couple other barley. Uh, it was 30 times more flammable than oil dust and, and then more flammable than gunpowder. So they had to watch it. It wasn't in, also with the stones, uh, they didn't want to wear the stones out, but the closer they got to the bottom stone, they could get sparks. So they had to watch out for that. Um, also candles, that kind of stuff. Any questions about... What was the stone made out of? Um, I just found this over here. That looks like part of the stone. Yeah, that's part of the grinding stone. Yeah. 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 Well, that's because it's uh, broken, I think. And people want to look at that? Or? Yeah, this, is, this is a smaller, smaller piece of the stone. Why did though? it have to come from Europe? Yeah. Uh, they were, they were better quality stones. Is it because of the geology? Uh, it was the makeup of the stone. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in Adamsville, Rhode Island, they have an uh, actual working grinder, water poly, okay. and they, they grind the formula right there. Yeah. Kind of fun to watch. I'll also mention in, in Mansfield, the Gurleyville grist mill oh. has all the interior equipment still available. Yeah. It doesn't run because it would destroy the material, the machinery. Yeah. And you can see the tire upper and the. And that's a great that's mill. A great that's a great free, mill. Open Sunday afternoons after I think yeah. Memorial Day. And where, where is it? Mansfield. Mansfield. Yeah. Oh, okay. got, you know that if you want yeah. mill, that's a great yeah. place to go. Yeah. Also the uh, from the Porter Mill, which is off of Route 66. Uh, part of that mill is up in Sturridge Village at the grist mill. Uh, I think Bill, I don't know where Bill went, but the uh, part of the sawmill or pieces of that we think is part of the, up at the sawmill up at, uh, up at Sturridge Village also. Mm -hmm. Is it true that people's teeth get ground down because of the stone dust? You know what, that, that a, <laughs> uh, you know what they... Is that true? No. <laughs> no, I mean, there could be, actually, they did, uh, when they called dressing the stone, they had uh, a person there, the, and actually, he was a, they called the dresser, right? And he had a pick, and they used to, it gets really fine, and they had different picks for the different uh, cuts in the stone, but that dresser, they probably had to do it every uh, two to three weeks if they were grinding a lot, uh, but they would take... Uh, to cleanse it out afterwards, uh, the miller would take and either put, so he'd have a bag of some older uh, grain or something, he'd throw that in, that would clean it. But they also used fine sand, and they would take, they probably before he put the, uh, the, the other meal in there, but they'd put fine sand in there. Okay. And that would, that would clean it out and grind it, it down, but uh, not a big, uh, if, if the miller probably wouldn't be used much. If they got too much sand in their flour. Yeah, we should. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions on this one? No. All right. Let's go up to the table up here. And uh, oh, so this, that down there, once again, that was a uh, a wool, uh, cotton factory, and they did uh, they uh, filling, which was. Um, they would take and uh, you used to do it by people stamping on the on the cotton and getting the impurities out of it and the oils. Well, they automated it with uh, water, and they used to have these hammers that come down and pound it. And uh, it, they did a lot more in a uh, time period than people did with their their feet. Yeah. Yeah. How did they transport uh, the flour and all the bags? Of, I mean, people farmers would come in with uh, you know their bags of. Uh, cornmeal or oatmeal or whatever it was, and uh, they would put it through the process. Uh, they they had a vat that's on the top of the where the wheels are. If it's a smaller one, uh, some of the more uh, bigger flour mills, grist mills, they actually had where it was brought in in the bottom, and there was these little conveyors that would bring it up and then take it up to like the third floor and uh, drop it in there. Oh. 
and uh, some of the some of the stuff had to be treated for moisture and this other type of stuff. But the miller knew what to do, and the miller would take. He had a little uh, out box uh, near the grinding wheels that, when uh, he started the grinding, he put his hand in there and uh, get some of this out. And if it was too sticky, you know, what there's too much moisture, too dry, he had to do something else. So I mean, these guys. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it, the thing was, and if it get ground too much, that the and it broke it down and it heated up too much, then the flour when they made, went to make bread or whatever, it wouldn't rise because it you know beat the heck out of it. You know, it's the same map, but one is the color part. And the, the 1860, uh, 1869 map. I also have on here. This kind of shows you what a bug looks like. Uh, the penstock. This goes over the filling a little bit, and this this toes about Sturva drillage. If you go online, you can get information on that. This goes over the different types. This is the the Young Miller Wright and Miller's Guide by uh, Oliver Evans, and this is this is the book with the reprint, and it's amazing. And it's one of the mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, actually, this is one of the. Um, and I made a I made a note here because I was reading through this, and it's. I measured the stone out, you know, between 54, there was a 56 inch stone. This stone could grind 500 pounds in an hour. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the revolutions on it, remember I told you how they control, yeah. you know, with the water coming in, this would go between 100 and 125 revolutions per minute. Wow. And so it requires 4.5 to 10 horsepower, depending upon the condition of the millstone. And, uh, so there is times where sometimes they, um, it, it's what they call a crane. But so if you had the bed, bed stone and then the runner stone, but the runner stone had this thing hooked to it. It was a, um, uh, like a crane that picked it up and it would bring it up like this. And uh, then that, the uh, dresser could take and dress the, uh, the millstone. But uh, if sometimes if, the, the miller, if something happens in uh, either he didn't close the gate correctly or something slipped, um, these stones could take off and, they, and you know, they'd come off the, uh, and then go right down through the floor. I mean, these, wow. these weigh, you know, 2,000, 3,500 pounds. Wow. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of weight here. How the heck they handle this? Did they mention what they used for lubrication? Was it ammo, fat, or...? No, they didn't use lubrication. Really? No. 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 Well, they had them, they were on the spindle. And, uh... But you, uh... Yeah, I mean, you had, they, the miller had to know what he was doing. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, you know, they'd have big issues, so... Any questions on the yeah. millstone? Yeah. yeah. How many millers were around here? I mean, there are lots of mills, but how many of them? Probably one for each mill. Really? The millers, they were. So we had 29 in Hebrew or 32? Well, around 30, 32. Really? Wow. Yeah, I mean, the millers were very secretive. They, uh, people that have delivered their, uh, their, their, their grain and get their flour, some of them never even saw the stone. So these were all enclosed. The millers had apprentices. And if they had a couple of them, they'd only teach one one certain thing and the other one another certain oh, thing, no so that they wouldn't know. Um, and, but they were very well off. So with a miller, it, they always took between 10 and say 16 percent of it. So if somebody brought in grain, they'd take 10 or 15 percent of it. Hmm. Then what they would do is they would uh, take that and they could either sell it, use it for their own consumption, and uh, they're very wealthy people. Right? Uh, Benjamin Skinner. I think uh, towards the end he had 120 acres, and he had a wow. few sons. But uh, yeah, the Millers were very secretive. <laughs> Someone said in there, and I, I read it in there, quoting, they said that a Miller spit could kill a frog. <laughs> so I mean, they were that mystical. <laughs> so how do they handle these big stones? I mean, uh, uh, they move them around and change what? them and stuff. Well, that was at the the base. The, the, the dresser had to do the base as it lay right. because that didn't move. But the other one had a, a crane, oh, had a which crane. was a crane with the metal hooks that came down, All right. and then it would take and it would flip up like this, right. and then they would take it. He would work on it as it was up there. Wow. 
Was yeah. it stone local, or did it come from a special place? Uh, a lot of the stones came from Europe or France. Uh -huh. So what would happen, they would come in, uh, in the ships in the, oh, a big block, and they would use them for ballast when they came over here. And so all this stuff had the green brought up from, uh, you know, from the, the coast by wagon or whatever. You know, it was quite an operation. Yeah, I mean, you had to look at it. I mean, there was well, look at look at the large stones on how the millwright had to move those to get them up there to make yeah. the. Uh, I mean, it's a lot of the. I think the later. Uh, grist mills, you'll you'll look at, and, and some of them, uh, they're, the buildings are over the wheels and stuff too. Yeah. Now that helped a lot, you know, in the winter time and you know, inclement weather and that type of stuff. But so then let's walk over towards the uh, sawmill. So this is also probably we're thinking this was a gate to let the water through. You can see how it's set up so that it could be grabbed and, and uh, rotated. This was found in the when my up. This was my uncle's house. You can. Uh, it was found down in the lower part of the stream. The the grist mills and the saw mills or whatever. All, all the cogs, and uh, all the the gears and everything else were made out of wood. So they would wear, and uh, so something could happen where a cog broke, and you know the miller had to get that repaired, or that would make the, the stone could go crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So. You know they had to be careful. So most a uh, lot of millers they also had the uh, uh, blacksmith shops. And the black you saw it was small, but they would make you know the parts for the uh, for the grist mills. The water would come up over the top here. All those stones up there you wouldn't even see them. They would flow right over the top, come right down here all the way to the top edge of the grass. Where those stones are piled up by the tree there? Yeah. Right over the top. Yeah. Wow. Uh, wow. My uncle had pictures here of ice and <laughs> big iconic right here all over the backyard. Yeah. Huge, huge pieces. Yeah. But when you're in the house and uh, our bedroom's on this side, it, when it's really high, yeah. it's almost unnerving. Yeah, I know. But now, <laughs> now it puts you to sleep. Oh, mm -hmm. this is good. <laughs> so this is this is a sawmill, but you're seeing it from another angle. So this sawmill, you got to realize it was on the top. Now these turbines, these go these go into the 1800s, probably the mid, you know, around 1860, something like that. So this, and as if you want, uh, get in a line and walk your way through. You're going to see how in the base here how it's cut out like this. And it's, it's concave. So why don't we do that, and then I'll talk a little bit about it. And so the wheel was up on the top there. This we're pretty sure was a uh, brush shot wheel. But this is a great. Uh, where do you see the uh, raceway and everything else here? But this goes back to around 18, 1813. It was brought around. To, um, was it Burroughs? Or? Oh, Burroughs owned it for a while. Burroughs owned it, and uh, yeah, Oliver Skinner then, sold it to David Burroughs. Yeah, and Norton owned it. There were a lot of people this, that owned yeah, it. Yeah, as we get up there, this this transferred so many times, and the, not only this, but the property over there with Skinner, you know, some of it would be sold, then the, the sawmill was put with it. Um, I bet you it was transferred. 10, 15 times. Mm -hmm. And then, after all these mills were gone, people were using it for pasture, and they made it, they cut it up so that cows could get down from different pastures, so there were, you know, a lot of owners along the brook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they all, you know, they had to have rights. If you, if you look here, you can see a real defined raceway here. And this goes all the way up to Barber's Pond, and so that's what, well, well over 600 and some feet back there, and it splits up. You can see the stream over there, and there's actually a dam up there. Uh, there's a stone up there, which is kind of unique. That's up near the uh, the dam, and it's got markings on it. So it, it it's thought that those markings were used for the height of the water. They wanted the water how high they wanted to dam it up for. Mm -hmm. So if if you look, so the water. My thoughts were that the water flowed through the stream, but it also continuously ran through here, and there was 
what was what was here to control the water? Penstock. Pen so <laughs> there was probably a couple penstocks here. One flowing that way that left open, and then one right here that controlled the dam. Now, June, what part of the house is this part? It, this is 1813, and it was the shop for the mill, we're told, or somehow associated with the mill. We're told there's an outhouse over there, and then the foundations down there were part of it, a barn or something. Yep. Not yeah. sure. So you thought I was kidding when I told you stuff, stuff ended up in the Connecticut <laughs> River, right? So here, once again, this, this is thought to have been a, a brush shot. Now, I should have pointed it out before, but do you remember down below where the stones went all the way down? So, as in the grist mill down there, they had stones there, but there was a place for the water to go out, and that was the, uh, you had the, uh, the head race and the tail race. This is where it goes down underneath here, and that's the tail race that goes back out to the stream. So, mills, they changed hands many, many times in their First, this was this mill going back around the 1830s or 1835 or whatever. Uh, it was a, uh, a woolen mill. So it bounced from woolen mills to uh, actually up to the mid 1850 to 1860 something. The, uh, the, there was a uh, H.B. White. H.O. White. H.O. White. Yeah was here and he, and he, he was a machinist and actually a young guy. Uh, he died in his early 30s but um, so these were made here. Now some of them have and, and it says H.O. White right on them and you can pass these around and take a look at them. They, but if you take this is this is the uh, US patent book. So if you look at the patents in here and this has more information on it but the, the first Patent was a uh, Augustus Phillips from Marlboro, but the patent got either burned or they couldn't find it. So there was a Jeremy Taylor that goes back to June 30th, 1836. So the second patent in the United States for bit stock is in this area. Okay. So, but H. O. White, and then they're saying that with that patent which you can see with on the bit stock that you had there, um, that same patent is the same thing that H.O. White had that he used from Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Taylor. So, so, that's, so when you look at it, we had a little industrial center here. You know, and as uh, Bill Drinketh mentioned, you know, they have uh, a ledger book that is kind of fragile, so I actually said we could put it out, but I, I thought better and I said, no, we don't want to put it out. But, it has where items that were made went all over the U.S., Canada, all over the place. But uh, so it was an industrial center. It really was. It was uh, the industrial center in Hebron back at the time. So, any questions? Could that be metric? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, back in that time, a lot of things were metric. I don't know. Measure. Yeah, you'll have to measure it. On, on a side issue, if you go into Coventry where the Bidwell Tavern is, oh, yeah. you go out on the street, I think it's Depot Road, yep. and it takes you to this little park, it'll tell you that they, they were manufacturing off that little bend of the river that you can't see anymore. It was like millions of dollars worth of product yeah. off of this little, and they they had like, I think, 400 people that they employed on this little, you know, wow. corner of a stream that you would never know, except wow. there's a park there now. Wow. So this was, this was H.O. White and a bunch of different people, right? So... If you go down to what they call the Gulf, which is Grayville Falls area, and we're thinking about putting together a tour there at some point, maybe next year, but uh, if you went straight into the park, that's where Washington Manufacturing was. If you look where the horses are over there, and if you kind of look across, if you look carefully, you're going to see some stones in there, and then you're going to see an archway that's probably about this high, and that was uh, Burroughs Paper Mill was there and then if you go down all the way to the end of Grayville and you stop at the bridge there and you if you pulled over and parked to the right and you walked in 30 feet mm -hmm. there's another mill there and that's that's Hebron manufacturing so Hebron manufacturing 
is also made these. So some of them that you may find will have Hebron manufacturing on it. These happen to have H.O. White on it. But, uh, you know, if we get to do that next year, I got to tell you, the, that's a real defined mill site and the raceway is really defined and it's, you can walk right up to the, where the dam was. Is that the one where if you go across the path you can follow the road? All the way, all the way out. There's one. Yeah, there's even the a geocache there. Well, the road, well, that, yeah, that road will go uh, up to uh, Jones Street. Jones Street. Yeah, okay. Them. Right. Yep. Okay. Yeah, as a kid, uh, we used to. I used to be oh, able sure. to take a jeep through there. Oh, yeah. Boy oh, Scouts. It's, it's amazingly well camp camp there. Of course, I took my Toyota Land Cruiser in a lot of places. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it depended how good the libation was. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so,